morning, everyone. Can I get you to look at your bulletin so we can just go through the, some announcements real quickly. First of all, directory photos. If you've gotten your directory photo done already, we are grateful. We're glad that you did that. We want you in the directory. We want to know each other. Uh, if you haven't yet, would you sign up? So April 13th through the 17th is the next sitting. There are sign-up sheets out there in the lobby on the table over on this south side. So if you would just do that today, that would be fantastic. Change of World monies are being collected today. That's going to Forgotten Man Ministries. Check out what's happening in youth ministry. There's several ways of raising funds for this year's Mexico trip. We have 12 students going, three adults going with them. They're scheduling service projects right now, so that's one way that you can help financially, is have them come over to your home and do some work. And uh, there's also Taco Tuesday coming up. You read about that. Congregational meeting, you can read the results of the congregational meeting. We had a good meeting the other evening. And then I want to talk to you just briefly about what's happening this weekend. So Friday, 6 p.m., Capri Drive-In, the CAMA, the Area Ministerial Association, will have a Good Friday service. There will be a movie following that for families who want to stay. There will be an offering so that when you drive through, if you want to give to help with the costs that the Capri basically are, are taking on themselves, that would be great. And then Saturday at 3 o'clock, we have our Saturday weekend service. This week, it will not be the, like the Sunday service. So it will be a service of, of readings and devotional. It's a holy Saturday service. If you've never been to one, I invite you to come to that. 3 o'clock on Saturday. Sunday morning at 7.30 will be our sunrise service. And then at 11 o'clock, a second service, our celebration of Easter service. Want you to come, if you can, to all of them. We will not be having a breakfast this year due to COVID, but we encourage you to spend time with family, friends, you know, go out to breakfast together or go home and have breakfast and enjoy one another, come back for the 11 o'clock service. There are other announcements in your bulletin. I will let you read those. We're gonna to worship together. If you would please pass the registers at the, the side of your aisles. Rows, there's our aisles are this way. Um, let us know that you're here this morning. <clears throat> Our call to worship is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 15. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And we're glad that that prophecy was fulfilled and we're going to worship him this morning. <laughs> Accept their praises, accept. 
proclaim Hosanna as well. Jesus saves. He saves because he loves. The Father sent the Son, demonstrated his own love for us in the sacrifice of his Son on our behalf. And Lord, we stand because of you. We stand before you because Jesus hung on a cross. We have eternal life because Jesus was raised from the dead. And we stand on that hope. We stand on your word, and we commit ourselves to you, Lord. Your people, your children, redeemed by your blood. You are the blessed hope. Thank you, Lord, for all your mercies and all your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue worshiping.
Praise for 
washing over all our sin. The people sing, the people sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. on the panel in your bulletin. I ask you to pray for those during the week and then see if you can be of help to the folks who are on that list. We're going to pray for them right now. Father, we pray for our church family that you will work in our lives so that our lives, our relationships together might become a platform upon which you shine and people can recognize you and worship you. So even in our great need, Lord, we invite you to come and be present with us to show yourself to be strong and loving in our lives and through our lives to those around us. I pray that you will cause us to move towards each other in love and, and wisdom. Show us how to help one another, especially our friends who are on this list today. When we pray for ourselves, we pray for your church around the community. Would you bless your people as they gather today, especially by speaking your word to them. And I pray that you'll do that for us right now in the name of Jesus. Any of you remember algebra, eighth grade, probably? Did you, did you do that? 
You don't remember it, though, do you? <laughs> in algebra, there's an order of operations to be followed. And I don't think my teachers made that sufficiently clear. So if you take things out of order, you're inevitably going to end up with the wrong result. So for example, I put an uh, equation on the screen for you to look at, 4 times, and then parentheses 5 plus 3 in parentheses. If you compute that problem from left to right, which is how we're used to reading in English, you'll multiply 4 times 5, you get 20, then you add 3, your solution's 23. That's all great, but it's the wrong solution. It's wrong because there's an order of operations that need to be followed. In algebra, it's necessary to perform operations within parentheses first. Now, if we do that in this equation, if we follow the order of operations and we add 5 plus 3 first and then multiply by 4, we'll get the correct solution, which is 32. In the Christian life, there is also an order of operations to be followed. The vision statement at Lockwood, committed to Christ, to Christ's likeness, to each other, to the world, reflects that order. Our initial commitment to Jesus is Lord, when kept and made, will lead to the other commitments, including the one to the world. That's because people who make a sincere commitment to Jesus as Lord will naturally, although with supernatural help, desire to be like him. And people who are like Jesus will, like Jesus, be committed to each other and to the world. If it's our commitment to the world we're going to explore today, but we, we need to get the order right. Commit first to the Lord Christ, then the commitment to the world is inevitable. Get the order wrong and make the commitment to the world first, and there's no guarantee that you'll ever commit to Christ. The only guarantee is that you will be really tired. The life of the Apostle Paul is a case study in how this works. The commitment he made to Christ as Lord led him into each of the other commitments in our vision statement, including the commitment to the world. It's that one we're thinking about. Let me read 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 22. This is St. Paul writing to the Corinthians, and he says, Though I am free, and for them that might mean something a little different than it would for us. In Corinth at the time, something like half of the population was in slavery. So when he uses the word free, it's in contrast to being enslaved. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under law, I became like one under the law, though I'm not myself under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law so as to win those not having law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul's radical commitment to the world was based in part on a belief that he held that not everyone shares. That belief underlies what he wrote in verse 22, where he explains the reason behind his way of life I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul believed that people need to be saved. Now isn't that old-fashioned? Nowadays when someone starts talking about being saved, people cringe. Maybe it's not racist or sexist, but it's religionist and that's just as bad. Who are you to tell me I need to be saved? For that matter, who are you to tell me that I'm not already saved? That is discriminatory and narrow-minded. Some people are offended by the idea, and that's not even to mention the assertion, that they need to be saved. And they're offended even though they don't know what it means to be saved, aren't sure that they want to be saved, and have no intention of finding out. 
but they do have a vague idea that being saved is about getting into heaven. And they've heard that not everyone gets in, and that offends them. That's a cosmic violation of the Fair Housing Act. But when Paul uses the word saved, he has so much more in mind than just getting into heaven. He knew that heaven's king is coming here to put an end to evil and to get his plan for creation back on track. For Paul to be saved was to escape the coming extermination of evil and share in creation's rescue. The true king is coming. Anyone can join him. No one can stand against him. But there's more to this word. To be saved, and this is one of the primary meanings of the word in the Gospels, is to be healed of hurts. Both those done to us, those done by us. To be saved includes being saved from the ultimate hurt of death. To be saved is not just to live again after we die. It's to live for the first time as God intended. Joyously, vigorously, lovingly, worshipfully, eternally. Paul understood that people's most pressing need can't be met by economical or psychological means as important as those things are. We need to be saved by a power outside of ourselves. Saved in the richest, fullest sense of the word. We need, we need a salvation that changes our relationship to God, that changes our relationships to one another, and to ourselves, that remakes us and sets us free to reach the mind-boggling potential with which God created us. But everywhere the apostle looked, he saw people not experiencing that, wasting their lives, awaiting wrath, heading for ruin. God didn't create us for this, for hatred and greed and despair and distraction. Christ didn't die so that we could fall further into such lives, but to give us new ones. Paul longed for people to have those lives. He wept at the thought of them being caught up in the terrible annihilation of evil. He was looking for ways to be an instrument of God's salvation in people's lives. And to that end, he was willing to sacrifice his rights or even to make use of them, if that's what it took, in order to persuade people to come over to God's side. And what's more, and this is relevant to us, he expected the rest of us to do the same. Listen to what he wrote just a little later in the letter. That was in the middle of chapter 9, this is chapter 10. Wrote to people, churchgoers, Christians, just like us, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't cause anyone to stumble whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example, as I follow the example of Christ. Follow my example, he says. Live the way I do. Be ready to make sacrifices in order to help people come over to Jesus. Everything you do, religious or otherwise, must make God look good. That is, do it all for the glory of God. Now, doing all for the glory of God involves both a negative, what we shouldn't do, and a positive, what we should. We do certain things and not other things, based on the impact our actions will have on people who have not yet come over to Jesus' side. Now, there are some things that are just morally wrong and some things that are morally right. But there are, are other things where we can choose what to do. And in those cases, how will that choice affect you who don't know Jesus yet? Paul states 
First, what we should not do. This is verse 32. Don't cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. Now, stumbling here and throughout the New Testament is not just about falling down. Oh, I did it again. It's not just about falling down. It's about falling away from God. Our actions, attitudes, and words can make it harder for people to believe in God and confess Jesus Lord. We can cause others to stumble. I've talked with many people over the years, since I first started pastoring, who do not trust God and won't even think about being involved in his church because of people who are in or were in the church. Some churchgoer did or said something that caused them to stumble away from God. Sometimes it wasn't what they did or said. Sometimes it was the attitude they held. Usually the self-righteous, better than others attitude that caused them to stumble. And sometimes the person who stumbled was a child. And tragically, the churchgoer that caused them to stumble was a parent, a mom or dad. The combination of self-righteousness and hypocrisy in a church-going parent is almost too big an obstacle for children to get around. Our attitudes and actions can make us stumbling blocks that cause people to fall away from God. Or our attitudes and actions can make us stepping stones that lead people to him. Of course, being a stepping stone means that you're going to get walked on. We're going to be called on to forfeit our rights, sacrifice our time and our goods so that people will come to Jesus and be saved. Paul was a stepping stone, not a stumbling block. He says in verse 33, I try to please everyone in every way. This week when I read that, I thought, really, the apostle Paul, a people pleaser? Yes, only not in the ordinary way. He didn't try to please people so that they would think highly of him, but so that they would think truly of Jesus. His goal was to bring people to Jesus and to the robust, life-changing salvation he offers. He didn't try to please people for his advantage, but for theirs. Pleasing them meant that he did things their way whenever he could as long as it didn't violate his loyalty to Christ. With Jews, he ate kosher. He took vows. He observed the Sabbath. He went to festivals. With Greeks, he went out to dinner and didn't ask about the provenance of the main course, whether it was used in ritual sacrifice or not. He talked to them about their favorite poets and about the athletic games. And why did he do this? Why did he try to please everyone in every way? Verse 33 so that they may be saved. That was Paul's mindset. The proud Pharisee who believed that there is a right way, the Pharisee's way to do everything, was willing to do things other people's way in order to win them for Jesus. He knew Jesus as the cure of hurts, the forgiveness of sins, the light of the world, the way to God, the king of the earth, the hope of glory, and he would do what it took to see people come to him. Paul was committed to winning people, not to conquering them, but to winning them to Jesus. Whatever he was doing, writing, reading, traveling, eating, teaching, tent making, whatever he was doing was subsumed into that goal, whatever it took he would do. And he expected us, this is chapter 11, verse 1, to follow that example. So ask yourself, what can I do to follow Paul's example? How about at work? Can I please my boss, my fellow employee in ways that are good? What about at home with my family, my children, my spouse? 
What would it mean for me to please the people in my life, to do what they want as often as I can, as long as it's for their good? Am I willing to do things someone else's way in order to win them? Paul wasn't only willing, he was able to keep at it year after year, and it was because he'd made those prior commitments to Christ, Christ Christ-likeness, to each other, that he was able to do that. Without those commitments, his commitment to the world would have collapsed. So will ours. Paul tells his readers, that includes us now, to follow his example. But I want you to notice that he was following Christ's example. He didn't come with it, up with this on his own. He learned that, that whatever it takes attitude to see people saved from Jesus. Jesus did what it took, even when it meant sacrificing himself. Paul followed his example. When we started, I mentioned the cringe effect, that awkward, embarrassing feeling people get when someone talks about being saved. Even I sometimes cringe when I hear people talking about or peddling, as the case may be, salvation. But guess what? When Jesus talked about salvation, no one cringed. What he said was natural, normal, full of good sense. And he not only talked about salvation, he embodied salvation. People could see what he was talking about just by looking at him. They could see why it was good. And Paul followed that example. He didn't just talk about salvation, he lived it. Well, thinking about that, what was it about Jesus, and Paul for that matter, that stirred up so much controversy and anger against him. If Jesus went around doing good, as the Apostle Paul sa- or Peter says in Acts 2, why were people so angry? Why'd they kill him? Well, that's a study for another time, and there are multiple reasons. Some of them are theological, some of them are political, some are cultural, and they're all intertwined, but I want to mention one. In the first century, a powerful idea governed Jewish society, and had for several centuries before that. Religious people should avoid irreligious people, sinners for short, whenever possible. Some of those sinners were the kinds of people we would expect, were thieves and prostitutes, but others were just ordinary people who had to work on the Sabbath, like shepherds. They couldn't take the Sabbath off or whose work made them ritually unclean, like tanners, Simon the Tanner, for example, or who did business with the occupation government, like tax collectors. It wasn't always possible to avoid those people. You needed to pay taxes. Maybe you needed to buy a sheep or have a new leather flask made, but you would spend as little time with those people as possible. They were sinners. One thing you would never do is eat with them. In that culture, Sharing a meal with someone identified you with that person. Eating together symbolized approval. So guess what Jesus did? He ate with sinners on a regular basis. And it was scandalous. Listen to what people said about him. Look at him, a glutton and a drunk, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. They complained, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner, they said in disbelief. The Pharisees asked, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And people had the same reaction to the Pharisee Paul once he started modeling his life on Jesus's. Why was he doing this? When Paul gave his reason, it was not for the sake of social justice, nor was it to shake up the establishment. This is how he put it. I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that, and here's his reason, they may be saved. Just like Jesus, who said the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Jesus, and later Paul, acted in what was then, and frankly is still, a radically subversive way. 
they befriended people, including sinners. They did this in spite of criticism, constant criticism, because they knew that God himself is a friend of sinners. Now, Paul's former colleagues would have vehemently denied that. They would have said that God is the enemy of sinners, but they were wrong. God himself, as Paul came to realize, wants <clears throat> all people to be saved. Is that what we want? <clears throat> Do we believe that people need to be saved? Need to escape when God makes an end of evil? <clears throat> need to be healed of hurts, need to be transformed to thrive in the coming age? Do we believe, based on what God has done in us, that faith in Christ is the, the best life possible? Do we really believe that God wants people, our neighbor, the person at work, the one we don't like? Does God want that person? Max Lucado tells the story of a girl named Cristina, a Brazilian girl, wanted to move to the big city, to Rio de Janeiro, but her mother wouldn't let her. Her mother said there are no jobs there for girls. The only jobs there are in bars and brothels. But Cristina was taken with the idea of going to the big city, and she left without telling her mom. Just disappeared. Her mom waited for a phone call or a letter, but none came. And so after a while, she went to the city herself to look for her daughter. And she took with her stacks of her own photos, photos of herself. And she pinned them on walls, on telephone poles, throughout the city's worst neighborhoods. One day, Christina, who had been forced to work as a prostitute, was surprised to see her mom's picture on the wall of a stairwell. She took it down, turned it over, and saw her mom had written on the back, Whatever you've done, whatever you've become, please just come home. She went home. Our lives, like those pictures, should say to people, whatever you've done, whatever you've become, please just come home. Our life should say, you are wanted. Many people don't know that. They didn't learn that when they were growing up, and they don't know it now. They don't know, but they need to know that God loves them and wants them. So whether we're eating or drinking or whatever we're doing, socializing, working, playing, serving, our lives should communicate, you are wanted. God wants you. It's not too late. Our commitment to the world, whatever form that takes, evangelism, compassion ministry, education, justice, is for the glory of God, a picture, if you will, of the one who wants all people to be saved. If we don't make that commitment to the world, other commitments to sports, hobbies, politics, money, comfort will determine where we go, who we hang with, what we say and do. Have you made that commitment to the world? Will you make it? Will you join Jesus who seeks and saves those who are lost? Or like Paul, seek the good of others so that they may be saved. Let's join God on his mission for the world. And may he give us his heart for the world that he loves. Let's pray. If, if that's a commitment you're willing to make, and if you've got the order right, would you make it now? Would you tell God that? I want to be an instrument 
of your salvation. I will be by your grace. Lord, would you hear our prayers and answer them with power. Would you make us at Lockwood Church a channel of your great blessing and salvation to our community and to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. You just mentioned a few things. There are go deep sheets on the back if you want to think through 1 Corinthians 9 and 10 a little more. Grab one of those before you go. You can always come to go deep on Wednesday nights over in room 303 in the other building. The Change Your World um, receptacles out there on the table. There are also picture sign-ups out there. And I'm going to put my mask back on and be up here for anyone who wants to pray. We're dismissed.